Grant. Um, and um, my, I can see already my co-author um, of this talk <laughs> and um, partner in crime for what I'm going to talk to you about today, Brent Wood, who you might know, um, is not here because I think he's buying a house today. So, um, so he's got a good excuse. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. So um, I'm going to try and talk to you. I'm not a technologist, um, really. So um, I'm a collection manager of, a, of one of the nationally significant um, um, natural history collections in New Zealand. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me if there's anything really technical. You might need to hold your question and ask Brent another time. <laughs> and I'm, he'll be happy to answer. So um, this was actually a talk I gave at the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections Conference, which is very geeky, and, but I loved it. And it was in um, Dunedin in um, August last year. So I've recycled it a bit, but um, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much. So just a bit of background. So I work for NIWA, which is the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, if you don't know. Um, it's a crown research institute, and we maintain nationally important data databases we have a big biological collection, um, and we have some large science assets and capabilities to help us undertake our science. Um, the part that I work in is um, enhancing the stewardship of New Zealand's freshwater and marine ecosystems and biodiversity. And um, the little dot there was to, <laughs> for the conference participants to let them know where we were, because we were in Dunedin. Um, and the program specifically I work in is the Marine Biological Resources Program. So we're delivering fundamental knowledge about the diversity um, of life um, in the New Zealand territorial borders, but also down in Antarctica and a little bit of the Pacific as well um, over time and space. So a um, little picture of my collection there. I probably would have put more collection pictures in um, if I had more time. Um, basically, I'm going to give you a little overview of the collection, um, what, what it is, um, a little bit about what database we use, the solution we wanted, the solution that Brent helped me to find, uh, how it works, and some outputs. So um, the Niwa Invertebrate Collection, lots of acronyms there. You don't need to worry about those too much. Um, but MB funds us. Um, and um, we get funded under the Strategic Science Investment Fund. And that gives us um, some money to look after the 300,000 jars of preserved marine invertebrates we have in our collection. So that's anything without a backbone. Uh, the fish go over to the to Papa collection, and we take everything else that's not a fish. Is this better? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so as I said, um, we've got animals from around New Zealand, the Ross Sea, and the Southwest Pacific. Um, we have 8,500 species in the collection, and um, we actually only have 140,000 registered jars. So we have quite a lot of work to go to get everything into our database. So we're continually adding to it every day, but it's a long way to go till we get everything registered. This little output on the map on the um, edge there is all of the points from inside the New Zealand exclusive economic zone. So lots of points around, lots of areas that are important for fisheries. So uh, the collection started in the 1950s and it started out with the New Zealand Oceanographic Institute collection. And it's been growing ever since. We get samples from biodiversity research cruises. So that's where I go out and I, uh, we're answering a particular question about a particular habitat. So maybe we're going to sea mounts or undersea volcanoes to um, learn more about the animals that live there. Um, we also get uh, samples from fisheries research trawl surveys. So they're assessing fish stocks and we get the bycatch, so everything that's not a fish. And scientific observers on commercial fishing vessels send us samples as well. So that's a lot of data coming in to us from lots of places. And we also have the Marine Invasive Taxonomic Service Collection, which is, has a lot of um, invasive creatures from ports and harbours that, that we're looking for, and also native creatures from around those areas. And we have an algae collection as well. It's quite small, and most of it's held at Papa, but we have some of the data at Niwa. So we look after all of that in a specified database, which is open source. And it's a really awesome piece of software for natural history collections management. It's got all sorts of great tables and fields in it that are very specific to what we do. So it's got locality information um, and preparation information about how a jar is stored and where it's stored. Um, and it has a big taxonomic tree behind it with all of the species names and the different levels of taxonomy. So it's developed um, at the University of Kansas. And they now run it through a software consortium 
um, in which we've joined as an associate member, so we get a little bit of help if we have some problems. Um, and it's used um, around the world and in over 450 collections, so it's quite widely used and lots of people really like it. Uh, so it's a suite of applications with an underlying MySQL database. And it... That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they store their collections up, um, up at Torrey Street and they have a, the National Fish Collection is there. Um, and they do have some invertebrates, but it's a much smaller collection than, of marine invertebrates than what we have. Um, they, um, they have like a really massive insect collection and, and other invertebrates there as well, yeah. Okay, so um, go back to uh, MySQL databases. Uh, so they are spatial databases, so they can store spatial um, points, lines, and polygons within them, and hopefully you all know what that means. Um, and specify doesn't use spatial data, though it could. Um, the coordinates are stored, so we have a latitude and a longitude coordinate, and that's stored um, just like as an X, Y number in a field, in a table. Um, we can have points and light, light, points um, lat long at the start and the end of a line. If we have a trawl, we have a start and an end point as well. So the specify database built in has a Google Maps kind of plugin. So that's really great for visualizing um, data just really quickly. We can um, call up a query based on a particular species or a collection or a collecting event, and we can drag and drop the data set onto um, the plugin and it will open in Google Maps. So it's really great for a quick look in, um, very easy. But we often get asked for a little bit more complicated data exports and um, we also need to get asked to produce publication quality maps. So we need to use a GIS program to, um, which has got a little bit more um, functionality behind it so that we can um, manipulate a lot more of the layers and add in layers and things. So we've been using um, QGIS. So we get a lot of requests for data from very odd shaped areas. So um, this example that I've got up here on the screen is um, vent polygons. So this is um, areas on sea mounts, so they're undersea volcanoes, which run up in a line um, up along the Kermadec Ridge. Um, and they, um, so we have ecologists that are interested what kind of animals living around these areas. So they made a request um, for all of the data that falls inside these polygons. So previously we would export that data. We can draw a nice box around all of the records um, within the, in the query, uh, with a query, and we would just extract everything and then delete records out that didn't quite fall in the area we thought. Um, and there's a few issues with that, or we, would, or we would send it to a GIS person who would plug it into their um, program, and um, we'd provide them an export which was done on a certain date, so it's not live. If we made any updates, the export would get out of date, or if um, someone identified a specimen, um, the name would change, and that would mean the data was out of date. So we can also only export 20,000 records at a time, and we, I said we've got 140,000 records now, so that's very tedious. Um, so it doesn't really work so well for us doing it that way anymore, and not everything lives inside a square box. So the ideal tool that we thought we would like is something that gives us direct access to our database. So um, something that gets us right in there with real-time validation of the data that we're entering, can give us publication quality maps. We can quickly compare and, and contrast different taxon groups at one time. We don't have to export one at a time. And we can integrate it with other map layers. So we came up with a solution, or I should say Brent, <laughs> uh, came up with a great solution for us to try in, with QGIS um, and a GDAL, Ge Geospatial Data Extraction <coughs> Library Spatial Data Access Software. So it's a virtual data source which presents non-spatial data sources, like I was talking about our Latin long, um, and spatial data. And it uses a file to describe that and where it, where it goes to get that data. Okay. So it describes, I'm going to show you the file that we used. So um, it describes what's, what's the data source, where can we get the data, what our database parameters are, the SQL that it's going to run to retrieve the data, the type of geometry data to provide, the columns where they where the X and Y sit, how to create the geometry, and the coordinate reference system for the lat and long um, where it sits in the world. And 
this opens as a file, so it points to the data, so it's not the data in the file, so it makes it live. As soon as we enter something, it's, it's updated on the layer already. So that's the file what it, that it looks like. Just to show you, that's the name of the layer of our collection objects. Um, our database details go in here, and um, this is the query that selects out the columns that are relevant to the data we want to get out of the database. And this is how it gets it out of the database. And just down here, the spatial reference coordinate system. So um, here's some screenshots from um, QGIS to show you what it looks like when we just load it in. So we can add the layer as a vector layer. So um, then we point to the, where the file is on our computer, and then it's just quickly live, grabs all of these points out of, out of the database. And um, if I right click on the layer, so up here is the layer um, in QGIS. So if I right click on the layer, it will open an attribute table, and that's got all of my data in it that's, that I've asked for from the database. So I can add all of the fields in my database to that if I want to, and get all of the data out into a mapping program, which is really powerful. Um, we can then layer on layers that are meaningful. So we have um, the layer here, which is for benthic protected areas around New Zealand. So for one project, I had to, to provide a, a list of all animals that fall inside those areas for um, the Department of Conservation um, and uh, the Ministry for Primary Industries. And then again, I'll just use my vent polygons as an example as well. Lots of poly different polygons on the map there. And I laid my data on the top. And then we zoomed into a couple of um, polygons there to show those records. And just to show you, I can um, code um, with a little query the different species that fall in these areas. So I've turned on different species to show. So the top two here are ones that live around volcanoes. And the bottom one here is a species that doesn't. Just to show, like, when we went to this seamount, we found something with active venting. And when we went to this one, we didn't. So you can start to do a little bit of analysis already. And also when I want to highlight this to get the data out of the map, um, I can use the select tool and I can just draw around points in a polygon. And when I right click on the layer, it can show me the selected points and then I can export that and give it to the ecologist who wants the data really easily. And then if I want to get all of the data points from all of the polygons on the map, I can do that with a little tool instead of dragging and drawing around boxes around all the data. Um, using the vector geoprocessing tools, there's a tool called intersection, and I can use that to give me a new layer called intersection, which is the intersect um, of with the data. So it will make a new file, which has got all of the polygon data and all of the data of the collection points that fall within it. So that's really now so powerful for me as a collection manager. I don't have to go and draw around just one square area and then delete things out in my Excel file. <laughs> it's a really powerful tool for me to analyze the data and pull it out quickly and then hand it to people that want to use this. So um, I mentioned before that QGIS it can do publication quality maps. So now it means we can put all of our points on a map and, and produce something for a, pa a paper or a magazine article. Um, and these are examples of some outputs. Um, and also, you can use different projections in QGIS. So you can do a polar projection for your data if you've got um, data from around Antarctica. And um, here, we always like to see New Zealand at the center or at the top. So we've got it uh, organized so that um, New Zealand and the Ross Sea, which is important to us, is lined up there. And this is all of our points kind of on a world view of where all of our collections are from. And a map that we produced just from the Ross Sea records. So it really was a, an ideal solution for us. Um, it gives us direct access in, in as we asked for. Um, it's live, so as soon as somebody registers something in the collection, it pops up in QGIS, uh, QGIS through that, that link. It's, it's amazing that we can do that so quickly. Um, and we can com quickly compare animal distributions on the map as well. Um, it gives us a lot more control over style of symbols and layers than Google Earth does. Um, and we can easily add all sorts of different data sets on top of it um, to help us make sense of our data. And we can change a projection really easily. 
make publication quality maps and it's all open source. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs>